Another day, another protest. Universities have given students a free pass to skip lessons today for a pro-Palestine protest through Sydney's CBD streets. One group proudly marched with their banner reading, Queers for Palestine. Next, it'll be turkeys for Christmas, no doubt. Meanwhile, at Sydney Uni, student protesters have been given permission to address classes and make a brief statement about Israel's war on Hamas. I wonder if that applies to Jewish students as well. I wonder who was demanding the release of hostages today and condemning Islamist terrorism. Dave Sharma, the former ambassador to Israel, now Liberal Party senator for New South Wales, joins me from Canberra. Dave, thanks for joining us. I, I know from uh, personal contacts inside some of the universities that uh, Jewish people, Jewish students and just people who are sympathetic to Israel are distressed by the amount of support that seems to be going towards these pro-Palestine protests. Uh, the authorities uh, try and pretend they're, they're even-handed, but this is intimidating and bullying and anti-Israel behaviour typically endorsed by the unis. It is, and it means that Jewish students on campuses, Chris, are feeling, you know, not only unwelcome, but besieged and under threat. I mean, universities should not be uh, allowing students to bring their personal political beliefs into the lecture theatre. Of course, everyone's entitled to their own political beliefs, but if you have a situation where any student can get up and vent on, you know, the issue that they feel particularly passionate about at the start of the lecture, you know, where does it end? It's going to be an unwelcoming space for any number of people. I don't think they're going to learn much in the class either. It's just a recipe for social division and, uh, and disharmony. I think it's a crazy idea. It's a crazy idea. It's not only uh, tolerated, it's encouraged effectively. The students have plenty of free time and there are plenty of other places. They can rally in the city any time they like, on the weekends or whatever. There's just no need to force the university to make these sorts of decisions. And mind you, it's not just the students. They've told their lecturers as well that they're allowed to take time off for these sorts of protests. I just don't think that that's on. I mean, I don't think people, you know, who, who are expected to turn up to work should be allowed to take time off for protests. If they want to go and protest, take leave, you know, or, or do it outside your office hours, just as in any workplace or, uh, you know, business or anything else. I mean, we can't have this situation where people are always bringing their personal political views into whatever it is, the workplace, the lecture theatre, the, you know, the hospital. What's next? You know, I mean, are, like a doctors and nurses going to be allowed to make a statement before they treat the patient about how they feel about a particular issue. It's just crazy, Chris. It, it is never-ending. And they're also told the lecturers that they, don't, they can't penalise academically anyone who skips lessons for these protests. So if you miss an assignment or you're not there for the test, instead of just suffering the consequences, it's the new dog ate my homework, you can just say you're, you're at some pro-Palestine pro -Palestine protest. Well, and are they going to apply this equally? I mean, what if you're you know, attending a protest about a policy that the university is likely to disagree with? What if yeah. you're going to an anti-renewable energy protest? What if you're going to some sort of far-right black shirt, anti-lockdown, anti-COVID vaccine protest? I mean, people all have strong views on this. I don't think we'd see the same tolerance expressed from the university towards that sort of activity, yeah. though, and nor should they be doing it towards this. Once you, once you cross the Rubicon here, all bets are off. Indeed. Now, uh, tell us uh, about uh, your thoughts on this uh, spy scandal. As a former ambassador and working in foreign affairs, you would have had top security clearance. You know how all these things operate. The fact that uh, the ASO boss, Mike Burgess, has put so much detail out there publicly, we know it's a former politician. It means there's so much speculation about former politicians, some who are very prominent in their dealings with foreign nations. Is it incumbent upon him or the government now to name that former politician so that all former politicians are not smeared? Well, I think, look, Mike Burgess has done an important service by alerting us to the level of foreign interference and espionage by state-sponsored and state actors uh, in Australia. That's important. But I think by putting this level of detail out there, um, rather than describing it in, in generic terms, he's obviously begged the question of, well, who is it? Where does the, you know, the cloud of suspicion lie? And is everyone under a cloud of suspicion? I think it was inevitable that people were going to start playing guessing games and pointing fingers and, you know, consistent with the law and, you know, protections of defamation and whatnot, I think it would be good if the government, who would know this detail, could 
clear this up and put the public's mind at rest that, yep. um, you know, this cloud of suspicion doesn't rest over all of us. As you've been walking the corridors and going into the chamber and ducking down to Aussies for a coffee and whatnot in Parliament House today, how many other politicians, staffers, bureaucrats and the like have raised this issue with you and speculated about who it is? It's been a topic of many conversations today, Chris, and, and much, much speculation. Everyone has a theory. Everyone uh, has an idea. Uh, as I mean, look, Peter Dutton offered today to allow the foreign interference laws, which Mike Burgess said did not apply in this case because the activity took place before they were in effect, to allow them to apply retrospectively, to allow this person to at least face the sanctions of, of the law. But I think, you know, we need to examine something like that because... We, we shouldn't allow the institution of parliament um, to be undermining the public's mind and I think addressing this issue and showing them that we know who it is and that the rest of parliament is OK would be an important show of confidence. Yeah, in the I think it's got to be done. Everybody's been talking about it all day. I've been convinced about it, it being three different people during uh, the day, but maybe the one I'm settling on at the moment is correct. We will see. Thanks for joining us, Dave Sharma. I appreciate it.